Good afternoon and welcome to BBC News. For nearly four hours now, the British astronaut Tim Peake has been orbiting the Earth on board a Russian Soyuz spacecraft. But first came this. He successfully blasted off this morning at three minutes past 11 with two other crew members from Baikonur in Kazakhstan bound for the International Space Station. They're due to dock with the ISS at around 20 past five this evening. Our science correspondent Palab Ghosh watched the launch and sent this report. Hi, Tim. A momentous day for Tim Peake and an historic one for Britain. Tim, how do you feel? Fantastic. Really good. We're ready. He's finally on his way to space. Tim and his crewmates are at the Cosmodrome to get ready for the launch. On the other side of the glass are his family, Tim's wife, Rebecca, and his sons, Thomas, who's six, and Oliver, who's four. This will be the last time they'll see him before he blasts off into space. With him is his commander, cosmonaut Yuri Malenchenko, and next to him, NASA's Tim Kopra. So how does Rebecca feel right now, a few hours before the launch? I am really happy. You know, it's, it's been a long journey to get to this point, so we're, we're really excited to get to this stage in the game, and I know he is, and he just looks so ready for it, so it, that's great. Then, a final wave goodbye, before Tim and the rest of the crew get on board their Soyuz rocket. It stands on the same launch pad from which Yuri Gagarin set off to become the first man in space more than 50 years ago. On board, strapped in, and helmets on. The crew receive their oxygen through their suits in case the spacecraft depressurizes during the launch. Now, they make their final checks. Boosters igniting, the engines firing. Ramping up to flight speed. The main engines have now started. Very soon, Tim Peake will be on his way to the International Space Station. And there he goes! And liftoff. Liftoff of Tim Coper, Yuri Malenchenko, and Timothy Peake on their way to the International Space Station. So far, getting good first stage performance. The Soyuz delivering 930,000 pounds of thrust from its four boosters and single core engine. The first stage of the Soyuz, 68 feet in length, 24 feet in diameter. It's going to be burning liquid fuel for the first two minutes and six seconds of the flight. On the ground, cheers and jubilation from his friends and family. Absolutely ecstatic. I mean, that must have been the most perfect liftoff. The weather, the view, uh, the sky, and then the condensation cloud, it's just magical. Pitch your and roll, nominal. Then, nine minutes later, Tim is in space. The astronauts are weightless. The danger from the launch is now over. For the next few hours, they'll be chasing the International Space Station in orbit and then they'll dock. After which Tim Peake will begin his five and a half month mission in space. Palab Ghosh, BBC News, at the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. Well, Tim Peake and his two crewmates will join three other astronauts on board the space station. This is Tim Peake here with the Union flag on his arm, the first astronaut in history to bear it. For the next six months, he'll orbit 250 miles above the Earth, working on a series of experiments on the effects of weightlessness, as Claire Marshall now explains. The International Space Station is a symbol of international cooperation, divorced from disagreements on Earth. Sixteen countries have helped to build it. There have been people living on it continuously since the year 2000. So, in numbers, it's 240 feet wide and almost 350 feet long. That's the length of a football pitch. At around 100 billion pounds, it's the most expensive object ever made. The pressurised internal space is the size of a jumbo jet and it's powered by an acre of solar panels. It orbits every 90 minutes and travels at five miles a second. This is the actual suit worn by the very first Brit in space, Helen Sharman. She, along with all the other astronauts, also have a seat specially moulded, it's padded, so that they're not injured when they return to Earth. 
It's strange to think that it's actually quite close. 250 miles is less than London to Glasgow, but life is just a little different. And rub it in. Again, so this is how you wash your hair in zero gravity. There's a great sleeping bag. And this is a bed, or rather a sleep pod. You just hitch your sleeping bag to the wall. Astronauts seem to enjoy the sensation of weightlessness, but it can be tough on the body. They need to exercise at least two hours a day to stop muscle wastage. And it's hard work. At any one point, there are over 300 active experiments on board. Some say the huge cost of manned spaceflight isn't worth it, that we can achieve more with robots. You can do more science on Earth than you can do in space with the same amount of money, but there's some science that you can't do on, um, on Earth, um, and there's so much more than just doing experiments. This is pushing forward the boundaries. This is international cooperation um, and looking for how people can survive on Earth and off the planet in the long-term future. Um, apart from anything else, um, this is putting Britain back on that map. Today, thousands of children across the country watched the launch live. One of the main goals of this mission is to inspire and excite. Among these faces could be the astronauts of the future. Claire Marshall, BBC News, in the Science Museum. And she's there now live and looking as ever, Claire, out of this world. Thank you. Thank you. What kind of introduction is that? I have to say, here at the Science Museum, you get a real sense of the history of this from 50 years ago with Yuri Gagarin to this, an exact replica of the lunar module that landed on the moon back in 1969. And this is our friend Tim Peake, who's now obviously on his way there. So with me to talk about the point of it all is astronomer Marek Kukula. Thank you so much for coming here today. Um, What's the point in putting a man on the moon? You at the Royal Observatory can see so much more with your telescopes. It's true that telescopes and also robot space probes can do amazing things, but I think there is something special when you see a human being up there. And I know I was really excited this morning to see Tim being launched into orbit. So, yeah, it's, it's about getting human beings into space. Even though the observatory could get a lot more cash if we weren't spending it all on putting Tim Peake Well, I think there are different reasons for doing different things. And, of course, when you send people into space, you get to study the way human physiology um, changes under those very strange environmental conditions that you have, weightlessness floating around the radiation conditions in space. So there, there are medical reasons, but also there are technological reasons. You can do things with people up there that you can't really do with robots. So I think it's, it's, it's still worth doing. What most excites you at the moment? We haven't been to the moon since 1972. Should it be that uh, the aim of Tim and the others is to look towards Mars? Or what should be the point of their mission in your view, what would be the most useful thing for them to learn? There is a big debate at the moment about where do we go from here. For the last almost 50 years, human beings have only been in low Earth orbit rather than further away. But I think there are now plans to go back to the moon, perhaps to have a permanent presence on the moon, and then to go to Mars. And I was thinking this morning, seeing all of those children here in the Science Museum getting so excited about Tim's mission, one of them could be the first human being to step on Mars, and it could be Tim's mission that inspires them to do it. And I think that's really the reason why we do this. It's about that inspiration, that urge to go out there and explore. In terms of all the science that's being done on board the International Space Station, in your view, what's the most important? What teaches us the most? Well, there are all sorts of things that you can only do when you're up there in space. I mentioned studying the way the human body responds to those very strange conditions. We learn new things about our bodies, which is medically useful. We also, by going up there, get to study the Earth, and we just had the climate talks in Paris. We couldn't understand the planet and the environmental dangers that we face without being able to go into space and study them. So there are all sorts of very useful things that we can do by going up there. You know, you know the stars, you know the solar systems... Yourself, would you like to go there? Are you happy, happy here with a large telescope? I would love to go into space if someone gave me the chance, but looking through a telescope is the next best thing, so I feel like I've been very lucky too. But I, I wish Tim every luck up there, and I think he's going to have an amazing time. Okay. Marek Kukula, thank you so much indeed from the Royal Observatory. So uh, there you have it, uh, all of us here, the moon. Back to you in the studio. The moon, the moon and the stars. Claire Marshall, thank you very much. And we are very much going to stay with this story. I've been joined by Professor Andrew Coates from the Mullard Space Science Lab at UCL, University College London. Good afternoon. afternoon. Is, it, uh, is there too much excitement around all of this or is this genuinely providing 
uh, really interesting and important scientific research, this whole project? Well, it's, it's hard not to be caught up in the excitement today. You know, the yes. first, uh, first <laughs> official British astronaut going to space after Helen Sharma did it before, of course. Um, and, you know, the excitement actually in the UK at the moment is how well the space sector is doing in general. You know, we're talking about uh, industry, but also academia, our projects which are, which are going to Mars and places, you know, just fantastic uh, stuff. Um, the International Space Station, though, um, is a very expensive thing, $100 billion, you know, large amount of money. But um, the, the relatively small amount of money which has been spent to, to get Tim Peake to go actually is well spent, I think, because it will help to inspire school kids. So with any um, you know, mission like this, it's a big high profile thing. Um, we're seeing uh, somebody that people can relate to on the International Space Station. The research itself may not be cutting edge. You know, the, the, the cutting edge type of research which can be done is to do with the exploration of the solar system, the moon um, and Mars and uh, uh, you know, going on to Saturn and, and Jupiter and places like that. And of course, Pluto earlier this year. These are fantastic projects. So we can't do that with this type of manned, manned space exploration. Um, but you know, what we can do is inspire people. I mean, it, it, not cutting edge because uh, what, the because scientific robots could do it more efficiently? Or, or, yeah, or? I mean, generally with space exploration, robots can be much more efficient. We can reach places that other spacecraft can't reach, so we can go to, you know, Pluto, comets, currently the Rosetta spacecraft at, um, uh, at its comet, making some very important discoveries. The International Space Station, low Earth orbit, um, it's a microgravity environment. Of course, effects on the human body, that's going to be interesting if we are going to be sending people to the Moon and Mars, etc., mm. which as an ultimate goal is great. But the International Space Station itself, you know, has been, has been relatively expensive for what it's actually achieved so far. Although not, not much of it paid for by Britain. I mean, who, take, who, to, who takes the, writes the bulk of the cheque for that? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's been, uh, you know, America, the Russian Space Agency, European Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency. I mean, it is a big international project uh, with many nations involved in it. And this is one of the sort of key challenges with it. It's a big engineering um, project which, is, which has been put together um, with uh, very good reasons, you know, it's using um, uh, using uh, technology which has been around for a while. But nevertheless, it, um, uh, it, it's a fantastic achievement to have been able to send somebody there and for them to be able to do some research on it. Yes, and you talked about some of the projects you're involved with, which includes Mars, for example. Well, Marek Kukula there saying some of those the fantastic children at, that, uh, at yeah. the primary school who were watching there in West Sussex, you know, such excitement on their faces. And that's great and, to and see. That, is that, is that the, the best element of all of this for you, I, the, I the inspiration side of it? Yes, yes, and, and anybody who can inspire to go into either space or science or science in general, numerate disciplines, this is the type of thing that we need um, for Britain's future. But our projects in the, in the next few years, so we have in 2018 a rover going to Mars, we're leading the camera system on that, so that in a similar way is going to be really inspiring, I think, once we, once we actually get it launched. And, uh, and again, there's a very large UK involvement, both in academia and in industry, um, on that project. So I'm really looking forward to that. And, and all of that, to tell us what, you hope, or to learn what? This is to look um, at whether could, there could ever have been life on Mars. And this mission, actually, is going to drill underneath the surface of Mars for the first time. So it's the first mission which may actually be able to tell us whether there was life on Mars. So to me, this is a fantastic project. And um, other projects, there's a, a, pro, a project going to Jupiter in a few years' time, the JUICE mission, which uh, will get uh, to Jupiter in 2030, going to orbit around Ganymede in 2032. It's looking at, um, at Ganymede, but also Europa, um, it, which is in the Jupiter system. And then there's Enceladus in the Saturn system, which has been looked at with Cassini. These are places where life could potentially be. So we're looking really at mankind's place in the universe and whether we're alone. You know, so space science is, is really important um, in the planetary science area, but also in astrophysics as well. Yes, very, very interesting. And uh, we may be talking about that in years to come, months and years to come. Thank you very much, Professor Andrew Coates from University College London. Thank you very much. And a quick reminder that our science correspondent, Rebecca Morell, will be here at four o'clock, just after four. She is going to be answering any questions you care to put to her. These uh, text as ever, uh, well, there's the hashtag on Twitter, BBC Ask This, and the text 61124, 61124. So if you've got questions, Professor Andrew Coates may have just answered some of them for you, but you may well have more about the, uh, all the work that's being done there on the International Space Station. That's coming up. Put your questions to Rebecca after four o'clock. Now back to Earth with something of a bum bumper, I'm afraid. We're just getting news from Los Angeles, uh, where we're hearing every school in an area of 720 square miles has been closed, and this is because of a threat. No specific threat, uh, 